What's up? Goldie here. And, well, this is a take two, as a matter of fact, um, of the breakdown today. Um, I I did a, a full kind of breakdown uh, earlier, but it was an hour and a half long, so that's probably a bit aggressive. So we're going to kind of blast through this. Not, I don't really want to make them that long. Um, and I try to get through everything here as quickly as possible. Uh, definitely don't, I did not able to talk about everything I want to talk about um, when we do that. But uh, that said, you know, people got uh, got shit to do and I don't want to listen to me yap for six hours a day. Um, so that said, here we are uh, on day three, I guess, of the season here. Um, happy April Fools, I suppose. Um and we got a 12 gamer here in the main, starting here in a couple hours. Um, so let's uh, let's just get right into it. Um, first of all, what we should notice is is some of the the cream is starting to rise to the top a little bit in terms of the pricing spectrum, um, and and the the fluff is, is getting uh, fluffed off as it as it were, um, and and falling down to the bottom, kind of where it should be. Guys like uh, JoJo Gray, bad numbers. Uh, Dean Kramer, low strikeout numbers. Jordan Lyles, bad numbers. Um, these types of guys down here at the bottom end of the spectrum, kind of where they should be and where they will be most of the season. And obviously the upper echelon guys, the Woodruffs, the Wheelers, the Striders, up here at the top. So um, initial projections we have pushed to the site. Mine are available now. Uh, they're on the projection page for premium members. Um, under uh, Goldie DK, I believe, uh, is the tab name. So they're there for everybody. Here's a, a quick glimpse uh, for the broader public to the pitching breakdown uh, and how that's looking out and shaking out so far. Uh, still have some updates to uh, be wary of as we move into the slate here that starts in, whatever, three and a half hours or something. Um but, uh, you know, so keep an eye out for updates and everything. But as of right now, this is kind of where we sit. So uh, when lineups come out, things will definitely adjust, as is the norm in baseball. But um, this is where the aggregates are uh, at the moment. So um, at True DFS, we, we take a, a full industry aggregate. Uh, we pull in as many projection systems from the various places that offer them uh, in the industry. And we make some, our, some of our own little tweaks. And, and then spit out a number at the end. We do that for both a fantasy point projection and an owner, ownership projection. Uh, Sheets does something similar. Um, and our, ours are just a, a little bit of a, a, a different um, calculation. So um, you can choose to use whichever aggregate that you'd like. Um, they're, they're both available for mine just now available for, uh, for DraftKings, um, MLB. And Sheets does it for uh, a, a ton of different sports. So um, pick your poison, uh, so to speak. But uh, these are the best aggregate projection that you're going to find anywhere in the industry. So um, if you are kind of on the fence uh, and interested to join us uh, for this uh, upcoming baseball season, feel free to, you know, we'll be doing some breakdowns or whatever, giving you an idea as to what we offer. Um but feel free to uh, come join us in the, um, you know, behind the paywall, and you'll get access to my projections, uh, the the full industry aggregates, uh, some premium content that we do just for premium members, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, feel free to come and join us. That said, let's um, get rid of the pleasantries and jump into the games here. Um, we're gonna go quickly because once again we got 12 on the slate and uh, there's a lot of stuff to talk about still as we we get back into the swing of things. Um, but uh, so let's just get into it. Um, first game here is White Sox in Houston. Giolito on the mound for the White Sox against Jose Urquidy. Uh, Giolito had some problems last season. Uh, with hard contact against right-handers, and we can see that displayed in the ISO number here at a full 230 and 1.7 homers per nine to the right side of the plate. So that's really his his big split uh, problem. He's a fly ball pitcher, and when he floats his four-seamer and his slider, that can get him into trouble. Slightly elevated walk rate, and we know he, that he has strikeout stuff, but you know if you can't um, if you can't throw by anybody. 
uh, often enough, and you can't stay off of the barrel of the bat to same-handed hitter, especially when you're a righty, uh, you're going to have problems. So that's I, I, wh- who I'd kind of like to target um, against him at an elevated price tag here for Giolito at 9,200, not really interested, certainly against Houston, a team that doesn't strike out. Um, these are lineups from yesterday, so obviously they are not uh, confirmed here yet, but um, that would be the usual suspects from the Houston Astros over here, Jeremy Pena, Alex Bregman. You can always play Jordan. You can play him against everybody. Uh, you can play Josie Abreu, too, 4,200. It's a decent price tag here against his old team. Corey Jokes, a lot of power, big prospect for them. David Hensley, big prospect for them, also a lot of power. Uh, Kyle Tucker, of course, hit a dinger last night. You can definitely get to pretty much everybody here on uh, on the Astros outside of Martin Maldonado. If you need the punt in the outfield, I'd rather play Corey Jokes than Jake Myers. So I'd stick to the top seven here. Uh, if you want to stack against Giolito, I think is a perfectly viable construction today. On the other side, Jose Urquidy, I don't really want to play him either. Uh, sub 20% strikeout rate is just not enough on a full on a full slate, especially when we're at you know either depth two or three of most of the rotations going today on the on the full slate. So um, just a 20% strikeout rate, also a fly ball pitcher, but he's on the barrel a little bit more, and that's a a worrisome combination with some hard contact. So um, he's susceptible also to the right side of the plate with a full 2.0 homers per nine. So the baseball could definitely fly here in Houston today. I would like getting to a lot of same-handed hitters. Um, We generally don't like stacking against Houston because their bullpen has been so excellent. But um, if you want to sort of 4-4 stack this game and reduce that variance just a little bit, I think that's a viable construction for sure if you can make it happen. I haven't tried to build it yet myself, but uh, I think that's a perfectly warranted way to consider building today. You can get to t- to Tim Anderson. Um, he's going to try and steal bases for sure. Luis Robert, he's going to need to get on base first. Uh, but he's got some speed as well. Benintendi, not so much in the speed department, but he's sticky. You can play pretty much the top half and almost everybody in this lineup to be uh, quite quite honest with you. Um, but once again, really good bullpen over here for Houston. So we don't want to go crazy with it, but you could play every one of these guys. Uh, splits really don't matter. You'd prefer the righties in terms of the raw power, but uh, you can you can get to Urquidy with lefties as well. 182 ISO allowed last season. Uh, and once again, just a sub 20% strikeout rate. So uh, mostly offense here, uh, no pitching in the Chicago-Houston game. Moving on, Toronto and St. Louis, um, kind of a similar take here to the last game, to be honest. Kevin Gosman on the mound for the Blue Jays, 9,400, um, maybe a little elevated for this particular matchup. We know he has strikeout stuff, 28% K rate with a 15.5% swinging strike rate. That really all comes from the splitter that he throws, really, really good pitch, and he really only relies on mostly the four-seamer in the splitter. That's a full 75% of his arsenal, 85% even, of his arsenal, throwing the the slider at about 15%, not creating a lot of value with that pitch, but really doesn't need it because the splitter is so good. So not too much susceptibility when attacking Kevin Gosman, um, but in this particular matchup with the strikeout stuff, probably diminished overall against the St. Louis Cardinals down here, and, and their sticky lineup, we... Might want to shy away from an elevated price tag and you know, a, a solid ownership figure here at about 15% so far. Um, that's not to say he's not playable. He's de- he definitely is. At, at, I mean, a 28% strikeout rate is, is playable against pretty much everybody in baseball. However, the Cardinals are one of the worst strikeout matchups in baseball. So keep that in mind. Um, I would say the projection overall in aggregate looks a little bit high to me given the susceptibility that uh, Gosman has um, to floating the baseball a little bit sometimes and pitching to a bit more contact. If he doesn't have the splitter working, um, I mean, he's not going to walk people too terribly often, but if he doesn't have the splitter and the slider is just generally not a very good pitch for him, he's therefore forced to rely on just the four-seamer, which puts him in uh, some pretty bad spots sometimes. And as we see here, just neutral value on the four-seamer itself at 95. Everybody in baseball can hit 95. So um, it's a little worrisome and pay- paying an elevated price tag for Gosman early in the season. While we know he's a horse and he can throw 90-plus pitches often, he really only 
goes in general about four and two thirds per start. So don't want to go too crazy at an elevated price tag. I think there's probably some better spots that we can get to. Um, doesn't mean you can't play him because, you know, he, he certainly has the upside to uh, at, at very low ownership blast through a, a high price tag. But at elevated ownership, no thank you. Jack Flaherty on the other side, he was um, – He's been hurt the last couple of seasons. The little bit that he did throw last year, he got beat up pretty good, certainly by lefties. Small sample, of course, but a 268 average allowed, 208 ISO, just a 21% strikeout rate with a full 10% walk rate. Uh, that's just to the left side. When you get over to the righties, he walked eight, or excuse me, 17% of right-handers that he saw last year. Sub 20% aggregate strikeout rate, aggregate walk rate of 13%. Just can't throw strikes. He hasn't been able to throw it over the plate yet, and I'm not touching him, and certainly not against the Toronto Blue Jays, a team that uh, doesn't strike out normally and can be very, very dangerous if you put people on base for free. So not going near Jack Flaherty. Would prefer to get to the Blue Jays and and, and full stacks. Um, we can get rid of this. Uh, we have lineups starting to trickle in a little bit. Um, I would like to get to... Uh, certainly Dalton Varsho again, uh, 3700 is a very workable price. Bo Bichette, still a playable piece, one of the better shortstop plays of the day, I think. Uh, but a full 12-game slate, so a lot of different ways we can go. Not going to have to worry so much about ownership on these guys, uh, but there's a lot of wind as well. So if they can get the baseball in the air... Uh, against Flaherty, if he's walking people, this could turn into a crooked number in a hurry here for the Blue Jays, just as it did the other day. So um, I think this is a perfectly viable stack to get to. It's going to be a little bit off the board. Um, so I like playing some uh, some of Toronto. Really no pitching, I think, for me here. Um, also, that doesn't really necessarily mean that I want to stack against Kevin Gosman. Still like Brendan Donovan at 41. I think he's underpriced in general. Lars, you could play at 38. If you're looking for a you know a short little two to three man, um, probably a little bit aggressive to get to Arenado and Goldschmidt at these price tags. Wilson buying the plate at 43, probably aggressive as well. So um, you know there are going to be plenty of opportunities to hop on board the Cardinals this season, but against Kevin Gosman, probably not the uh, most equitable route. So moving on. Milwaukee and the Cubs. Brandon Woodruff on the mound at 10-3. Probably a bit stiff here for me today. Um, we know he has the strikeout stuff at 30% K rate. Suppression metrics, 3-0, ERA, 315, 314 expected. Doesn't walk people. Um, he's not going to beat himself. Fly ball pitcher at uh, you know a slight 0-87 um, fly ball lean in terms of the ground ball fly ball ratio. So a little bit of susceptibility to the right-handed side of the plate. At a 171 ISO, 237 average allowed is fine, but a 308 WOBA uh, with a 27% strikeout rate depressed a little bit from the numbers that he exhibits against left-handers. So a bit of a reverse split for Woodruff. So if we're going to maybe hedge off of some of the ownership that we get, if we have a good bit of him, um, he's coming in at about 16%. You could play more of him if you'd like, but I think getting to the field with him at about 10-3 today is probably fine if you're building a bunch of teams. Um, single entry... You could play him, of course, because 31% strikeout rate is 31% strikeout rate. You know, no other way to slice that. But compared to some of the other value, a little bit cheaper on the mound, there's probably some better spots I think I'd prefer to get to um, contrarian-wise in in the shorter tournaments in terms of single entry and three max. One and a half homers per nine allowed uh, for Woodruff. So if we do want to get to some of the Cubs, you want the power bats and the guys that are going to be able to hit the ball on a line and in the air with some power. We also have some wind concerns. It's mostly a crosswind, but it's just blowing in slightly as well. So not super crazy about offense here. Uh, in general, you could play some Nico. He's not necessarily a power bat, but um, you know, at the top of the lineup, he can certainly make it difficult on Woodruff because he doesn't strike out. Um, some of these other guys, Dansby certainly has pop, but we don't really want to be targeting Woodruff in general. If you do end up getting a, a good bit of exposure to him, though, I would hedge back with some Nico, um, perhaps a Cody Bellinger. I mean, he stinks. He's going to strike out a crap load in this matchup. But uh, until he figures out his, his swing mechanics and fixes it, um, well, he's going to be playing for the Cubs and not, not playing for the Dodgers. So um, don't really want to go after Woodruff, but not necessarily my favorite uh, 
construction to attack the the most expensive pitcher on the day when I think there's a couple of other guys that we'll get to, namely Spencer, Spencer Strider right here, um, that we could consider that may provide a little bit more value, and they don't have to go through freaking Nico Horner uh, and his 12 or 14% strikeout rate or whatever it is. On the other side, Justin Steele, 6,000. Good value here for Justin Steele. Um, Brewers, last season, um, they struck out at a huge, huge clip against left-handers. 25, 26% nearly, created at a, a subpar um, rate at 92 WRC+, plus, 143 ISO, so st still a little bit of a pow uh, power surge for them, of course. But just a 300 WOBA, so mostly league average numbers. They did walk at a good clip and, and can get on base. So that is a little bit of a worry here with Justin Steele if he is going to put people on base for free. Does have the strikeout rate, so I think you can, at a $6,000 price tag, target him. What really makes me balk is eating a full 30% ownership on a, on a starting pitcher. Um, even though he is a value pitcher and that is kind of priced in for the price that you're paying, uh, I think it's probably a little aggressive in general, in a vacuum. So the the projection looks, in aggregate, probably a bit high, but really good numbers here for Steele um, overall. The average allowed to both sides of the plate, 232, 248 to lefties and righties respectively. No power that he gave up last year, pretty much at all. So he's not going to get blown up. Huge, huge ground ball rate, and that's why. He keeps the baseball on the ground, stays off the barrel. Sub-4% barrel rate is one of the better numbers on the slate. So uh, one of the better numbers in baseball, to be quite honest. So a lot of uh, pretty good value here with a respectable strikeout rate at 25% and a high ground ball rate for Steele. Good weather um, in Chicago as well to sort of corroborate that. So you can definitely play some steel if you'd like in deeper tournament stuff. I'd absolutely get to some of him. Um, I don't think you will need it necessarily in single entry and three max to just have to click him in. Um, there are other areas that you can go, but it's certainly a fine play nonetheless. You could, I would probably play him in cash for sure though. Uh, okay. Let's see. Uh, let's move on to Philly and Texas. Like some offense here a little bit. Um, not necessarily from the Texas side, but certainly from the Phillies. Zach Wheeler on the mound for Philadelphia. 10-1. I really like this a lot. Definitely at 8.5% uh, ownership where he's coming in at the moment. Doesn't walk people. Excellent strikeout numbers. Excellent suppression numbers. Doesn't put people on base for free. And stays off the barrel of the base, or the of the bat, rather. And makes it really, really difficult on hitters because he's got a very solid three-pitch mix and mix in a curveball. Not a ton of value for him on the curveball, but um, a good four-seamer sinker slider mix that uh, that he mixes up very well. Uh, JTR calls a very good game behind the plate. Um, so I love playing Zach Wheeler, especially when he is... Um, He's not very popular, so I uh, really like targeting him here uh, and no real susceptibility to him. Definitely not in power numbers uh, or hard contact or anything like that. So I think he is a far better play than Brandon Woodruff today, uh, given the ownership figure. On the other side, we have Nathan Evaldi. I want to I want to attack Evaldi. Um, 9,100, number one, is too expensive for him. Um, he does have a depressed strikeout rate to what he exhibited earlier in his career um, he's trying to throw too many damn pitches here he his cutter is the cutter and slider combination here are uh, really not working for him at the moment I think he should focus more so on the four seamer splitter curveball you know but that's just me he's got a really good split so that allows him to uh, really navigate a lot of um, trouble that he could put himself in with the lack of a really good four seamer and bad a bad slider and a bad cutter here. So um, he really gives up a crap load of power and we want to target him in general. 225 ISO allowed to the lefties, 174 ISO allowed to righties last season, but it's really the homer numbers. 1.8 homers and 1.7 homers per nine to lefties and righties respectively. So uh, he gives up power to both sides of the plate. You can full stack against him. Now, it's going to be a little bit more difficult to get to full Philly stacks here. Uh, where are they? Uh, here we are. Um, 
because of the pricing, right? Uh, 5,900 for Trey, 56 for Schwarber, I really do like. 5K for a catcher, even though it is JTR um, on a full 12 gamer, it's kind of tough to stomach sometimes. But Derek Hall at 2,700 playing for Reese Hoskins here at first base makes this much more palatable to get to. If you want to throw in a Bryson Stott at second base, he's cheap. Jake Cave is possible to play down here, 2,500. Um, as are Alec Bohm and, and Brandon Marsh. Uh, with Nick Castellanos. So you could pretty much stack the Phillies a bunch of different ways here because Eovaldi gives up a lot of power. He also had a marginal spring, really hasn't seemed to figure out the power issues. Um, and even in his most recent start against the Royals in the spring, I believe, he gave up two or three dingers in, in an inning. Um, so he still has issues, and uh, he's just flat out overpriced, so I don't want to go near him today. Really like the Phillies and Wheeler. You can play full correlation teams here if you want. You can play short stacks. You can you can do all sorts of things. Uh, I think this is a good spot for Philadelphia. Uh, okay, moving on. Atlanta and Washington is probably going to be one of the chalkier stacks of the day in the Braves. Once again, they get Jojo Gray on the other side, who has some serious problems. Uh, we'll get to him in a second. Spencer Strider on the mound for the Braves. Hopefully he's healthy. 9,700, going to see a lot of ownership, as he naturally does, because he's got a 38% strikeout rate. Okay, This is elite territory. The only drawback for Spencer Strider is the control. He's got a very, I mean, I don't want to say concerning, but notable walk rate of 8.5%. We need him to go deep into baseball games, and we need him to throw strikes. Uh, he has a little bit of susceptibility because he's only got two pitches. He really doesn't need to more than two if he has the full-on command DeGrom style. But at the moment, he doesn't have that. If he could develop a third pitch in the changeup here, he would be absolutely deadly and probably a top three arm in baseball. As of right now, he's... He's a top 10 arm, I would say, um, but he has a bit of work to go. He's still a young pitcher, so um, if he could develop this pitch, he, he really started to use it a good bit last year toward the end of the season. If he could develop the third pitch, he will be a smash play at anything under 14,000, pretty much every single slate, um, because his four-seamer and his slider are so, so, so good. So uh, you can absolutely eat this 24 25% that you're going to see on him today as long as he's healthy and as long as he is not restricted in terms of pitch count. He stays off the barrel and pitches to a very, very low contact rate. Nobody can touch this guy. So we don't have any, any problems here. Um, it's really just going deep enough into games and the ownership that we need to consider. But um, he's going to get a hapless Washington Nationals lineup over here. They are terrible. They're going to be bad again this year. So you can certainly attack with Strider um, by all means. Click away. JoJo Gray on the other side. Uh, we want Atlanta here. We don't want JoJo. Uh, 5800 for him, even though it's a depressed price tag, and he has a 24% strikeout rate. Can't touch him because he walks too many people, and he's on the barrel. He's a fly ball pitcher that gives up some hard contact on the barrel of the, of the baseball bat, and that is a terrible recipe which translates to a 1.6 homers per nine to the right side, but a full 3.4 homers per nine to lefties. 333 ISO allowed. This is one of the worst numbers you're going to see for a starting pitcher in baseball. He's anchoring their rotation effectively with, well, I mean, he and Patrick Corbin, um, they're in every sense of the word an anchor, um, a collective anchor, I, I suppose, because their numbers are, are just horrendous. And it, even though the Braves disappointed a little bit the other day against Patrick Corbin, um, you can go right back to him because there's wind blowing out in in Washington once again, 22 mile an hour, kind of a crosswind as well. But uh, you can get to everybody here on the Braves once again, uh, including Orlando Arcia, who basically stinks down at the bottom of the lineup. Uh, you, but you can play every single one of them. Uh, Michael Harris really stands out at 3,700. I think this is an excellent price. I hate playing Marcelo Zuna, but um, you kind of have to play him today, especially if you're stacking and if he's in the middle of the lineup. He was in the five or the six hole the other day. So they may do something fishy here with the lineup, uh, but I like everybody, including Matt Olson and, and mostly uh, the lefties. But don't leave off Acuna just because he's 6,200 or whatever. He'll get on. He'll steal bases a uh, whole nine yards. 53, Austin Riley got a huge, huge price bump. But um, it's definitely warranted in this particular matchup. You can move to Ozzie Albies as well. Really good second place play here if he's down here at the bottom of the lineup. Uh, I, li I like everybody here, including Sean Murphy, who shit the bed. Um, 
all over everyone. So play everybody from Atlanta, but be careful of the ownership. They are going to be very chalky, uh, but it, it's perfectly warranted today against JoJo. He just doesn't have the stuff. Uh, okay. So let's see. Uh, we're obviously not playing any Nationals against Strider. So uh, let's move on. San Francisco against the Yankees. I kind of like the Giants here a little bit. Uh, I think it's a pretty damn good spot for Alex Cobb. 6,900. Interesting price tag. Probably a little elevated in general for him, but he's got fantastic numbers. 24% strikeout rate. Doesn't walk people. Throws strike one. Gets ahead of hitters. The swing strikes leave a little bit to be desired, but um, suppression metrics, 373, 315, 289 XFIP here. Uh, he could even be better than he exhibited last season because he doesn't he doesn't beat himself. He stays off of the barrel because he's got a 3-to-1 ground ball to fly ball ratio. That is a huge number and one of the biggest numbers in the league, if not the biggest. Um, well, he's right up there with Framber Valdez, who has like a 4-to-1 ground ball to fly fly ball ratio well for Alex Cobb here uh very low ownership against the Yankees we have to be wary of the weather uh as of right now last by I checked um I think you're going to be able to play this game and certainly starting pitchers as well uh could be dry but it looks like weather is going to move in uh you know toward the end of the game or later on this afternoon this evening uh on the east coast so uh like Alex Cobb here numbers are great no power problems um, and he has strikeout stuff, and the Yankees are not totally immune to striking out. Now, last season, they did strike out at a 22.5% clip and created, of course, mostly buoyed by Judge at a 113 clip, 181 ISO, of course, a lot of power, and they get the ball in the air. So in general, that would not be a super favorable matchup to a ground ball pitcher, but he is a heavy, heavy ground ball pitcher is Alex Cobb. So this is a perfectly playable spot for him, and he's got enough strikeout stuff with a really, really good two and even three pitch mix, sinker, splitter, curveball. That is a really unique arsenal uh, in terms of starting pitchers across the league. So um, difficult to get a handle on Alex Cobb a lot of the time. I think this is a pretty okay spot if you want to get very contrarian with it if you're playing a chalky Atlanta for example you can throw in an Alex Cobb and differentiate yourself nobody's gonna be playing him so I like this spot um, on the other side we have Clark Schmidt who is a bullpen arm I gave him a couple of starts last year to the Yankees uh, looks like they're gonna have him in the middle of the rotation at least give him a look in the early part of the year here, uh, I want to target him as well because he's got some pretty big issues to the left side of the plate, namely a 268 average allowed and a 171 ISO with just a 21% strikeout rate on the barrel at pushing 10%. This is a big number. Um, so we want to target these sorts of things, and absolutely we want to target them when there's wind blowing out to dead center in what amounts to a freaking high school field over at Yankee Stadium. So. Um, a lot of these guys over here in San Francisco can get the baseball in the air. So we see lineups start to trickle in. That's Lamont Wade. That's Michael Conforto. Wilmer Flores, don't shy away from the righty-righty matchup here. He's a very good hitter. At 3,200, he is underpriced for his upside. Um, Jock Peterson, 42. This is also a pretty good play, as is Yaz. You can play Tyro if you want. Uh, Brandon Crawford, not super wild about it at shortstop. Um, he's kind of on the back end of his career, doesn't have a whole lot of upside anymore, but uh, Yankee Stadium is Yankee Stadium, and um, you could throw it out from home plate. Uh, I mean, I could hit it out of Yankee Stadium with a freaking golf club. So um, you can play Blake Sable, big prospect, and it looks like he's going to be probably in the list with uh, Mitch Hanniger on the shelf for a little while. So um, it's a very cheap catcher play. I think you can play a lot of the Giants here. I like them here, and if you can get them at plus money in the betting market, I think it's a pretty decent play, assuming that the game plays. Uh, don't really want to target anybody. Um, I don't want to target Alex Cobb with anybody. I mean, you can always play Judge. I'm not I'm not touching him at 6,400 against a heavy, heavy ground ball pitcher like this. Uh, all of these other guys, I mean, I'll just I'll pass. If they blast Alex Cobb because he's floating the splitter today, I mean, so be it. But um, no, thank you. I prefer the Giants side of the game in this one. Okay, moving on. Angels A's. Uh, Patty Sandoval, I think, is a really good play today. Um, his ownership is, you know, it's middling. You can deal with 12, 15% ownership or something on a starting pitcher on, on a 12 game slate. Uh, he looked excellent in the spring and excellent in particular at the uh, the WBC throwing from Mexico at 9,000. I think this is a really good pivot off of a pitcher we'll get to later, but he's got fantastic numbers. I think he's really going to take the stride um, this season into 
anchoring the rotation. He'll be the number one for these guys. Uh, I, I think he's the number one. Well, I mean, of course, they, they've got Otani, right? But, um, you know, outside of him, uh, I think Sandoval is, is a fantastic arm, and he is very, very versatile. He needs to work on, on improving the value of the four-seamer and not throwing the change up you know, as much if it's going to provide negative value for him. But if he improves this here, uh, I, I think he's he, like he can already suppress contact to the right side of the plate with a, a, a below average changeup. So um, if he can improve the value of these these two pitches here, uh, this will make him deadly with a, a full five pitch mix. He's got excellent swinging strike rate respectable strikeout rate suppression metrics will come down if he can improve the, those two pitches specifically the four seamer because you need to work off of the four seamer um if you're going to really dictate counts so stays off the barrel uh one and a half ground ball to fly ball radio ratio every number here looks fantastic really nothing to get concerned about perhaps a little bit um notable is a 10 percent walk rate to righty so if he can clean that up a little bit i think he's he's very easily, he could be a number one starter for every um, other team in baseball. So I really like Patty Sandoval. Uh, also like the Angels a little bit, getting uh, Shintaro Fujinami over here on the other side. However, he's 5,500, and this guy's got a live arm coming over from Japan. Don't have any stats on him in the sheet here, but um, he's got pretty good stuff. He's he's older. He's been uh, in the NPB for uh, 10, or he was in the NPB for 10 seasons, and just now coming over to the MLB, but he's got a live arm, throws a splitter, uh, and he's got 95, 98 in the tank, I believe, on the four-seamer as well. So um, you can play him at 5,500 if you need it. Uh, if you get to something uh, super expensive, uh, perhaps a Toronto, perhaps an Atlanta, and you just stack everybody, then you can throw in a 5,500 Fujinami here. Uh, they've never seen him have the Angels, so perhaps they saw him once in the spring. I'm not sure, but uh, most of their lineup, or at least a couple of the guys, uh, notably Trout and Otani, were playing in the WBC. So um, Fuji Fujinami will have that advantage in that most of these guys have never seen him. So uh, I think you could take some shots here uh, on a very live arm uh, that's got some gas, and he's got a, a very unique pitch uh, in the splitter and the angels last year they struck out at a 27 percent clip against righties um, now that will decrease a little bit with the hopefully healthy anthony rendon uh, but hunter renfro still strikes out brandon drury he'll strike out a little bit they made a lot of upgrades to their lineup so they'll be markedly better this year they should be at least um, especially with a healthy mike trout otani is otani so Perhaps Otani has seen Fujinami. I don't really know. Maybe over in the over um, in the NPB. I'm not totally sure. But uh, if there's any history, it's very minimal. So uh, like the Angels, pretty much everywhere here, uh, you can stack them. You can also play the other side. Uh, I'm not playing anybody from Oakland uh, against Patty Sandoval. All right. Uh, Mets and the Marlins. Tyler McGill, he is replacing... Uh, Justin Berlander in the rotation, 7,200. I'm not going near him today. Uh, I like the price tag on him, but um, the the real issue we run into with McGill is he's got a terrible changeup, right? 202 ISO allowed to lefties, 18% strikeout rate, and 1.9 homers per nine. Miami Marlins, they're going to be very, very sticky this season because they've got Luis Arise, Gene Segura, and Yuli Gurriel. Avi Garcia doesn't strike out a whole hell of a lot. Um, these other guys kind of will Cooper, Jazzy, and Georgie, but uh, like, there's a lot of power here and a fully healthy lineup. John Birdie is a pest. Um, he'll steal a crap load of bases. Nick Fortes is is not a zero uh, behind the plate. These guys are very pesky. And Luis Arise, it really all starts with him at the top of the lineup. He and Gene Segura, they're going to make things very difficult on a lot of opposing staffs this season. Uh, so I'm not touching most of the Mets staff, um, or pretty much anybody, uh, against the Marlins. They're going to be very hard to navigate. Um, that said, they don't have a lot of power and a whole hell of a lot of upside generally, but they're going to be able to get on base and... Um, if Jazzy and Garrett Cooper and Georgie Soler can realize a lot of their power, they could be, you know, sneaky and dangerous. Not that they're going to win the division, but 
be a pretty good team. So I'm not touching Tyler McGill here. Has strikeout stuff, um, but a major susceptibility to the left side of the plate, and that's going to make it uh, really difficult on him um, against the Marlins. Eddie Cabrera on the other side, 7700 for Eddie is a good price for him. The problem is he has a terrible four-seamer and a terrible sinker. He has good off-speed stuff and breaking stuff, but... The problem with, with Eddie is that he can't throw the four-seamer or the sinker for a strike. He has a full 11% walk rate, a 56% strike one rate. He can't throw it over the plate. And I'm not going near anybody that just can't locate and command a fastball on a regular basis. Certainly not going near him against the Mets, right? Um, one of the more sticky lineups in baseball for sure. So uh, no pitching here in the Miami game. Prefer offense. Um, if I were to get to anything, but I'm not super stoked about getting to offense uh, really in general. But you can definitely get to um, some of the righties for the the Mets. Um, and that's uh, that's Starling Marte. That's Pete Alonso territory for sure. You can play some Tommy Pham. He'll probably be in the lineup as well because Eddie Cabrera has a 226 ISO allowed to the right side of the plate, 15% walk rate. So he's going to put guys on base, full 2.1 homers per nine to righties. So um, he, he can't c control the fastball, and he's going to walk people, and that puts everything in, in stack territory. Uh, elevated barrel rate as well. So if they can get the ball in the air, and the Mets certainly can, uh, I think they're a viable contrarian stack to get to and consider as well. Okay. Moving on, trying to get through quickly, guys. Uh, Pittsburgh and Cincinnati. Um, Rich Hill at uh, 6,800. Interesting price tag for Rich Hill. I think we're going to be able to to jump on board this price uh, in this range and Rich Hill at various points in the season. Uh, not today, um, because he's got the wind blowing out in in Great American, another high school field. So. Uh, but in general, like, I think this is an okay range for him. He still has a viable, I mean, he has a pretty good curveball still, um, but he's got a viable cutter that he's added over the last couple of seasons. Slider's not bad, but he's throwing junk now and really just trying to survive. Um, the issue we'd run into, number one here at this price tag, is he's not going to go very deep into games. Only throw about 75, 80 pitches in general, four and two-thirds per start last season. So, um if he could stay healthy, number one, it seems like he has sort of solved the blister issues that plagued him uh, in the earlier part of his career, but just a 20% strikeout rate. So in general, um, not the most targetable for Rich Hill, but nothing to really speak of in terms of um, susceptibility, perhaps a little bit in the ISO department to the right side of the plate, 255 average, 187 ISO to righties allowed. Uh, but just 1.2 homers per nine. Uh, that number will, it should increase a little bit when playing games with uh, a lot of wind blowing out in Great American Ballpark here. So we'll have to keep an eye on that. But um, that said, I would like to get to a little bit of the Reds. We do have their lineup here. Johnny India, Spencer Steer, the two hole. I really like this. 3,100. He came over in the, uh, I believe, the Tyler Molly trade last year. This is an excellent price, and nobody's going to be playing him at third base today. I, th I think this is really strong. Will Myers, he strikes out a crap load, uh, so a little bit of susceptibility there. But Rich Hill, once again, not going to blow it by him. I think this is an okay spot to get to Will as well. Uh, Tyler Stevenson you can play. Uh, I love this kid. He's got a hell of a lot of upside, 4,000, very playable catcher piece. Kevin Newman against his old team, um, you can play him. Stuart Fair Fairchild is a cheap $2,000 outfielder if you need it, but I really like the top. Uh, top four here for sure, uh, and you can definitely add in a Kevin Newman at a at a respectable price, 3,700. Not really a five hitter necessarily as Newman, but um, this is definitely playable. And on the other side, we do have Nick Nick Lodolo here. Here he is going to be uh, mega chalk, pushing 30% ownership right now at 8,800. I think it's fine. Um, in general, however. Uh, this lineup in particular for the Pirates, uh, I'm not sure I want to be targeting um, overall. They brought McCutcheon back. They have Carlos Santana, who doesn't strike out. Good hitter here for Brian Brian Reynolds. O'Neill Cruz, he's going to strike out a lot against lefties. But uh, Cabrian Hayes, he'll strike out too. But Connor Joe doesn't. So they're going to be a little bit sticky to navigate. Not near as hard to navigate as the Marlins, for example. But 
um, and Nick Lodola has a 30% K rate here, so uh, not something we need to be terribly worried about, but a little bit of susceptibility to the right side of the plate, 252 average, 344 Wobe is a big number, and a 175 ISO. So gives up some contact, doesn't necessarily translate to homers, but he's also pitching in the same weather that that is Rich Hill. So um, keep that in mind. If he, if some of these guys from the Pirates can get the baseball in the air, some of the fly ball hitters, notably, um, like, like a Cabrian Hayes, he can get the baseball in the air for sure. Uh, it could get out in a hurry because Great American Ballpark is a tiny, tiny yard. So uh, at this ownership, I think it's fine to mix into your pools. The aggregate projection looking perhaps a little bit stiff um, as a median, but not to say that he can't blast through this and, and pop for 30 or something. Um I'm, I'm, I'm okay with this. I, I If we're looking for a pivot, I'd prefer to get to Patty Sandoval. Um, but you can you could definitely play a some Nick Lodolo. Uh, just play him in cash. I think it's, I think it's okay. Um, but you don't have to play him in cash. I, th- I think you can pivot off of some of this, um, given the weather and given the little bit of susceptibility that he has um, and the lineup for the Pirates. It's going to be a little bit better than it was last year. Don't go. Don't want to go out of my way to target him necessarily, but um, I think you can. It doesn't mean you have to play him on the mound. I, I guess. Uh, okay, Minnesota and Kansas City here. They disappointed both of these teams uh, the other day. Sonny Gray on the mound for the Twins. Um, 24% strikeout rate. A lot of variance though with Sonny. Like he's throwing a lot of junk. Two really bad pitches. Sinker and the slider for him. Not really creating any value, but he's throwing him full 20 plus percent of the time. His good pitches are the four-seamer and the curveball. We should just focus on this. Maybe add in the cutter or dial in the cutter um, to go with the slider. And I think that would be a more viable pitch mix for him. But sinker's not horrible. Um, you know, it's it's okay, but it's it's really not providing a ton of value for him. So um, there's variance when we play Sunday Gray is, is basically what I'm trying to say, which makes him a good tournament play. And certainly at very low ownership, he has – the strikeout rate to blast through the Royals here when, when, I mean, there's still a lot of young hitters over here on, on Kansas city. So, um, if you want to play some Sunny grand tournaments, I think this is okay. Uh, in cash, I wouldn't go near him and probably not in single entry or three max, maybe, maybe, maybe get to him into some 20 max, not, any major susceptibility uh, stays off the barrel and doesn't really walk people does Sonny. But if he could really dial in the sinker, he'd be back to his old days when he was pushing a 30% strikeout rate. Uh, So I don't really want to go out of my way to target him necessarily um, with any of the Royals outside of deep tournament stuff. When he's bad, he could be really bad. So you can stack the Royals in deeper tournaments, but it's not a very high probability play uh, by any means. On the other side, Jordan Lyles, 6,200. Good price tag for Jordan here. I think there's some times of the season where he's going to blast through this and he's going to pop for 30. He can still spin it a little bit on occasion, and when he's feeling it, uh, this 18% strikeout rate is actually quite low. Um, In aggregate, though, that's where he sits at 18%. Doesn't walk people, so he's not going to beat himself. But at this stage of his career, he is you know, just a back-end sort of innings eater type of starter uh, with still some pretty significant susceptibility to the left side of the plate. 278 average allowed, 365 Woba, and a 222 ISO. With a sub-20% K rate, once again, slightly elevated walk rate and 1.8 homers per nine to the left side. So uh, if we want to attack Jordan Lyles, that's how we want to do it. It's with lefties, not so much with righties. And from the Twins, the left side of the plate, where are the Twins? Right here. That's Kepler. That's Trevor Larnick. That's Nick Gordon. That's Joey Gallo territory, okay? You can always play Byron Buxton or Carlos Correa. So if you want a full stack against Lyles, I think it's perfectly fine. Um, it's going to be pretty ignored on a full slate here. So uh, I think it's a viable play. And on the other side, if you want to do like a 4-4 sort of game stack, I think it's okay. There's the, there's some weather concerns here. If they get the ball up in the air, uh, you can see some... You could see some big crooked numbers again, uh, you know, similar to what we saw in the Toronto-St. Louis game uh, the other day. What we were hoping to see uh, two days ago in in this game, in the first game of the series. So um, no pitching here for me in general, maybe some deep 
tournament stuff with Sonny Gray. Uh, prefer offense here most of the time. Not a priority stack, though, by any means for either one of these guys. Okay, uh, Detroit and Tampa Bay. Spencer Turnbull back healthy. I believe he's returning from a TJ or uh, and I don't want to make anything up, but um, I, I don't remember off the top of my head what his injury was, but we don't have any data for him from last season. Um, as we move along through the year, we'll obviously have more data, but I'll also try to get some of his more, um, his older statistics uh, into the sheet so we can kind of get our bearings here a little bit. But, Turnbull, as always, uh, been just kind of an innings eater, uh, respectable starter. Not a huge strikeout rate from Turnbull. Uh, will pop at this price tag uh, on occasion. Um, I'm not going to target him. I want to see if he's healthy first, and I'm not going to, I'm not going crazy. Even though, um, in Tampa, it's a good ballpark for pitching. Uh, I, I generally don't like targeting the Rays as is. Um, they will strike out, but. Uh, they're also very sticky, and with a, a healthy lineup in Wander Franco and Brandon Lau, um, I don't really want to deal with that. Yandy Diaz is a pest at the top of the lineup, doesn't strike out, and he's a really a pain in the ass to get through. Uh, Randy, obviously a good hitter. Manny Margot will strike out a little bit, but um, has plenty of speed and will make things difficult on the base pads. So they got Josh Lowe here, Isak. And, and Frankie Mejia, all capable hitters. Uh, Josie Siri down here at the bottom of the lineup um, can flip it around as well. So kind of a difficult spot, and I don't really want to go anywhere near somebody just coming off a uh, significant injury where they haven't thrown in the big leagues in the last year and a half. Uh, on the other side, Zach Eflin. We can target Zach Eflin sometimes. Um, certainly with lefties, we like going after him. Buck 90 ISO allowed to the left side of the plate and a sub-20% strikeout rate. In aggregate, just 21%. So he's only markedly better, or marginally better, I should say, uh, against the right side in terms of raw strikeout rate. It's a good matchup, of course, against the Tigers. They're going to strike out a crap load still. Um, they really haven't made all that many improvements to their lineup. But if you do want to play some guys like some lefties, in particular uh, Revenge Narrative Austin Meadows, you could play that. You could also play a cheap Spencer Torkelson. Eflin's not going to blow it by him, and that's Tork's major weakness. It's a swing and miss. So at a 23%, uh, excuse me, a $2,300 price tag on DK here, if you need that, I think that's fine to get to. You could mix in a Javi Baez if you want, or a Riley Green, something like that. I wouldn't go crazy stacking the Tigers, though, in Tampa. Uh, Eflin's still a, a respectable arm, and Detroit stinks. So uh, no thank you, really, for pretty much anything in this game outside of uh, some Tampa pieces. I do like Wander at 4,600. I do like Brandon Lau at 37 as well. Um, not crazy about playing Yandi in general, but he's fine if you want to round out a stack. Uh, okay, you can always play Randy as well. All right, last game of the day here, uh, Baltimore and the Red Sox. Dean Kramer on the mound. Not a lot of upside from Dean Kramer, unfortunately. 6400 is a fine price. Um, hopefully, you know, toward the end of last year, he exhibited uh, a good bit of strikeout upside, which was very surprising because he's only got a 17% K rate in general. He doesn't walk people, so he's not going to beat himself. Um and if he can dial up the strikeouts here, he could be a very, very viable piece for the Orioles. And he's totally unowned. Um, Boston's lineup is most often, you know, it's just going to disappoint this year. Where are they? Uh, here we are. Um, Verdugo, Devers, and Yoshida at the top of the lineup. Justin Turner still a capable three-hole hitter. Uh, but Adam Duvall, you know, there's some raw power upside. Same thing with Tristan Casas, but overall a, a very weak lineup in general. I mean, they've got Reese McGuire down here, um, you know, catching for them. So not a whole hell of a lot of upside. If you want to go after Dean Kramer, I think it's okay, though, because he only has a 17% strikeout rate. He's not going to blow it by anybody, and he's not going to – he like, he throws to an 80% contact rate here. So not um, anything to speak of in, in a way of swinging strikes. Very low call strike whiff percentage here. At just 25%. It's on the low end for starting pitchers in um, in baseball. So uh, can't play him and and don't really – I mean, I'm not super jacked about targeting him because he didn't give up a lot. Like, he is a, a pretty neutral ground ball to fly ball guy, so nothing really to speak of in terms of attack ability. Um, doesn't give up a lot of power. Just is going to – 
you know, mix things up and, um, you know, with the four seamer cutter change curveball mix, four pitches, uh, even though two of them aren't all that great, uh, it's still a four pitch arsenal that uh, pitchers have to navigate. He even mixes in the sinker here a little bit. Um, you know, 8% clip as well. So I uh, don't really want to target him necessarily, but you can get to one-off pieces like a Devers um, pretty much always. Alex Verdugo, meh, at 4,200. Uh, not a lot of upside in general, but he's okay. Uh, you can play some Yoshida for sure. Um, so if you want to run like a three-man or, or or full stack, uh, you could throw in Tristan Costas as well against Dean Krim. This is it's perfectly fine. Throw in Justin Turner, uh, whatever you want. Um you know, there's a high implied run total, but uh, I'm not crazy about attacking him in general, so um, not my favorite. On the other side, we have Chris Sale back. Hopefully, he's healthy. Um, not gonna, not I'm I'm not dealing with it just yet, uh, even at a depressed price tag to his historical performance. Um, he's gonna be owned, and at greater than 21% ownership, uh, greater than 20%, I should say. Uh, I'm I'm not going to deal with it if it burns me today against um you know a pretty damn good lineup over here in the Orioles. I mean I'm just going to have to live with that. I think there's plenty of other spots I'd rather go than than messing with a guy coming off of injury. I I know he's thrown plenty of you know he's thrown in the spring and et cetera et cetera. Uh, I want to see him do it in in the regular season and I want to see these numbers. Um, start to aggregate a little bit before I start to jump on board and take positions on, on Chris sale. Uh, do I want to short him necessarily on the other side with the Orioles? I mean, sure. If you want, um, there's still variance with Chris sale. We know that he, he's been blown up in the past and there's a good list over here for the Orioles. Now they might put Cedric down here toward the bottom, uh, as they did a, a good bit last season against lefties, but you could play Rutch, you could play Mountcastle, you could play Santander. They're going to, they're probably not going to move much. Uh, Gunner, you could mix in as well. We generally don't like playing lefties against Sale, but um, he's okay if you want to full stack and just hope that, that Sale is just going to be bad. Um, Ramon Urias, Austin Hayes, Georgie Mateo, even Ryan McKenna, all playable pieces here to fill out stacks if necessary. Uh, they are expensive, though, to get to the top three guys, top four guys, uh, or whatever. Um, and stacking against Sale, not my favorite, so uh, not too wild about that, but you know, plus 140 here, if you could find it, might not be the worst punt in the world to go get the Orioles. But keep in mind, um, Boston should be able to take apart Dean Kramer here pretty good. So that's really where we stand. Um, briefly, I suppose we can go over stacks. Uh, like both sides of the Houston White Sox game for offense, like Toronto a, a, a good bit as well against Jack Flaherty. Um, not wild about getting to any offense in the Milwaukee Chicago game. Um, like Justin Steele, you think you could play a little bit of this. Uh, Philly, I like a lot. Of course, Zach Wheeler, you could play against Texas, who will strike out. Um, and like Philly, certainly against Eovaldi, I want to short them. Um, him at uh, 9100 for sure. That's too too expensive. Uh, Atlanta, of course, you're gonna you're gonna be playing against JoJo Gray. They'll be very popular, uh, but it's perfectly warranted. JoJo's he just doesn't have it yet. Uh, San Francisco, I think, is an interesting, if the game plays, um, and viable stack to correlate with Alex Cobb if you want to. Um, I think I, I like the San Francisco side of this game uh, as opposed to the Yankees. I think they might be able to steal one, as I mentioned. Um, you can play the Angels for sure against Fujinami. I think I'd probably prefer to take shots uh, in tournaments on Fujinami against the Angels instead, but that doesn't mean you can't play them. Really like Patrick, Patty Sandoval there as a pivot off of Nick Lodolo down here. Um, no offense really to speak of necessarily in the Miami game. Uh, I, I definitely don't want pitching, but uh, you can play some righties against Eddie Cabrera. You can play some lefties uh, against Tyler McGill as one-offs if you need them. Uh, no Pittsburgh really for me against Lodolo. Don't really want to short him, but um, I, li I do like Cincinnati. You can get to the top half of the lineup here against Rich Hill. I think that's perfectly playable. Uh, both sides are playable here in the Minnesota KC game as well, as we mentioned. Um, some variance definitely with both of these starting pitchers here. No pitching uh, for me. Detroit, I'm pretty much off outside of like mega deep tournament stuff. Um, Tampa, same sort of thing. Maybe you get to them a little bit in, in 20 max. Not a priority though. Um, don't really want to go after Turnbull. I generally liked him in the past. Uh, so... I, I just want to see. I'm going to watch this game today. I'm, I want to see how they um, they treat him. 
uh, both Tampa and Detroit's um, Detroit's uh, coaching staff. Uh, so really, probably mostly a fade of this game. Um, if anything, it'd be like an Austin Meadows. I think that's a really good play um, as a one-off. And maybe some Tampa mini stacks or something. Um, you can get to a, a Baltimore stack, as we just talked about. And same thing with Boston. So uh, a lot of playable spots here today. Um, sorry it's so long, but you know there's a lot of games on the slate here. So this is kind of going to be the process we'll go over um, as we get a little bit more familiar with pitchers uh, later on in the season. Um, we'll maybe get in, be able to get into the to the weeds a little bit but um try and, and keep it as short as we can once again check out the aggregate projections guys that's really kind of the bread and butter of what we offer here at true dfs um good good numbers and when we couple the good fundamental analysis um in all of the sports that we offer and good dfs theory in terms of lineup construction and and th things like that uh with couple all of those uh, with the really strong industry aggregates in terms of projection and raw ownership, uh, that's really where we can shine. So um, check it out if you uh, if you want to um, join us behind the paywall for the projections. Uh, please feel free to head on over to TrueDFS and um, and sign up. And uh, that's it for today, I suppose. Um, good luck. Excuse me. Good luck today. And uh, let's get it.